the Hoboken Historical Museum. And it's always a great moment when we unveil something new. And uh, this was a special project for us. Uh, I believe we started raising some funds in June. Uh, the two authors are very generous and said that they did not need to be compensated, that this was a gift. And then the new print-on-demand program that's out allowed us to print maybe 100 books. There were about 50 people who supported it. And just from those people in the room, I think we've sold the last of the 50 books. So that's pretty cool. Thank you. It means that we'll be doing a second printing. And if someone is really enamored with this topic and wants to pledge funds for the next printing and have their name on the donor page, you still have that ability and we have a, flower, uh, we have a, a flyer about that. So we're not done. We're not done fundraising, we're not you know, finish with getting copies of They Taught Us Well printed. Um, you know, a lot of people think like, you know, books are passe, everything's on your phone. But I think, you know, it's not like, you know, books are gonna overtake the phone, but we live in both worlds. And I feel this program allowed us to do that. The way we're going to run the evening is I'm going to bring the two authors up and acknowledge them. They're going to acknowledge certain people, but we would like to open up the floor to people who primarily were teachers or who were affected by teachers to tell their story. And we sort of have done this type of format from when we do our chapbook release parties and it works great, and I think it's gonna work great here because it all depends on the people in the room and the wine. No, just kidding. Uh, so uh, I think we have a great afternoon ahead, and without further ado, let's bring up both the authors of the book, Vincent Cassessa and Bill Miller, and let's thank them. Thank you very much. Uh, another author told me that having a book come out is like giving birth to a child. And I said to Vincent, this is our little baby. And today is the baptism of our child. Vincent, aren't we proud? Yes, we are. Yes, and we're, we are. And uh, Bob may have mentioned to you, and I didn't hear him say it, this is being broadcast on YouTube. Yes. So we're being broadcast all over the world, even Antarctica, who knows, you know, watching us here. I had this idea a couple of years ago about doing a book when I started in 1970, there were 400 teachers in Hoboken. Well, that's a lot. I don't know how many there are today. It did come down a bit. But I said, you know, Vincent, let's do something about the teachers that left a mark on us, that influenced us, people we worked with. And it's time to do it. And one of the sparks was Claire Stickle, who's 94. She couldn't make it today. She's not feeling well. But her memory was remarkable. So Vincent and I set up an office in the exclusive <laughs> Malibu diner at a table and we would invite people to lunch. And so they would sit pen in hand in a book and I'd take notes about how, what people they remembered. I'd throw a few names out, what mark they left in your life, et cetera, et cetera. And Vincent, how did that go? Oh, it was wonderful. We sat in that diner and we, um, we knew names of people that we wanted to put, put in the book. And then we started to receive um, nominations from the rest of people in Hoboken and the staff. So once we did ours, we were busy getting everything together and it was born. Wonderful. I just returned the other day from the 150th anniversary of the Holland America line, and they used to dock at the Fifth Street Pier in Hoboken. If you're from Hoboken, you may vaguely remember they moved away to Manhattan in 1963, but still, they were a big part of Hoboken. And I mentioned Hoboken all the time at my lectures, and all the stories, the old crew members that were on that said, they used to go to the town lunch and have food. Remember at the town lunch? Some of them worked, some of the ships stayed in a whole week and they would get a little job during the week as a short order cook to make a little extra money. 
But the big thing back in the 50s that they remembered about Hoboken, the Dutch sailors, they could buy underwear, fruit of the loom, which they didn't have in Holland in those days. And the quality was so good. So we would go to these shops on Washington Street and buy fruit of the loom underwear and nylon stockings for their girlfriends and bring them back to Holland. Anyhow, I'm going to go to Florida Tuesday and I might see a friend of mine who's the vice president of a luxury cruise line. He was my student at Calabro School in 1996, and now he's a top executive in the cruise industry. So the effect of all of us, Vincent, all of you on people, which we'll continue in a moment, that have influenced lives and careers and whatever. When I was in fourth grade in the old Wallace School, Miss Marino, who's long forgotten, one of the honors in the morning of the week of school was to be, she would pick you for one reason or another to take out the teapot electric clock that was probably in her kitchen from years before, and you were allowed to hang it up on the nail and plug it in. And that made you feel special. And one week I got the job of hanging up the teapot clock. And then at 2.30, 2.45, your job was to take the clock off the hook, unplug it, and put it in the closet with the glass doors. And you felt special. And that's what a lot of teachers did. They made us feel special. They didn't just teach us, they made us, they saw things in us that we didn't even know we had in us. And that lasts for the rest of your life. Hoboken teachers were fabulous. They were an army of educators and wonderful people that turned people around, changed lives, made them better, and always we should be proud and so forth of that. When I was in sixth grade, I had Mr. Joe Coleman as my homeroom teacher. He dressed impeccably like a Hollywood star. And I, as a little kid, I said, I want to dress like him someday. I want to look like Mr. Coleman. Thank you so much. I want to look like Mr. Coleman and so forth. So anyhow, and then when I was in 10th grade in Hoboken High, which by the way, happy birthday, Hoboken High. It's the 60th birthday of the opening of Hoboken High School. And I was one of the first classes as Vincent, oh, you were there then too. So anyway, because I liked ships, I wrote an article in a magazine. I just sent it in. I typed it on my little Tom Thumb typewriter, and they published it. And I went in to my homeroom teacher, Miss Mary Ann Villanella, and she said, William, this is lovely. Your name in print in a magazine. She said, go right down to Mr. Gaynor and show him. Well, Mr. Gaynor was God. I think he was about 10 feet tall and so forth. And everybody respected and uh, what a lot of things liked Mr. Gaynor because he didn't just sort of congratulate anybody. And I showed it to him and I sh and said, and he took my little hand and he shook it. <gasps> Mr. Gaynor shook my hand. Oh my God. And he said, I was doing a good thing. Keep doing it. Well, I just published my 115th book, and that's all because of the Hoboken school system. How lucky was that? Wonderful. Thank you so much, Hoboken, for all the good things that we've had, and there's so many wonderful stories to tell about all of that. Fabulous. And one last thing, I'm very fortunate to have traveled all over the world on ships and everything else, and I had a lady, some of you might remember, named Miss Marnell. She was a tough cookie a little lady in a black dress that could make football players cry. If you didn't, if you didn't have those margins straight and the way she told you, forget it. You've got the red mark across your thing. What, what, we, what I didn't know about Miss Barnell was that in the summer, she used to, right after school closed, she'd get on a ship and sail all over the world and be back by school opening in September. And I said, oh, this is nice travel in the summer, be a teacher for the other year. And Miss Marnell actually said on one of her trips, maybe I'll send you a postcard, William. And I, that summer in August, I got a postcard from Fiji, from Miss Marnell. I said, I can't believe it. She, this woman who terrorized us, she was a great teacher in a lot of ways, but she was tough. I got a postcard from Miss Marnell, and that launched me into, I said, it's done. I'm becoming a teacher, and I'm going to travel just like Miss Marnell. But I'm going to come back with more stories in a moment. But right now, I'm going to turn it over to Vincent, my wonderful co-author, who has a fabulous memory, too. Vincent. Thank you so much. He's going to come back with a lot of stories. And 
we're going to, um, some people that we chose to honor will stand up as we read something about them. But before I do anything, I want to thank the staff here so much. Bob Foster, it was like a second family to come to. Sometimes I just wouldn't come out of the house for days. And when I got involved with the Hoboken Historical Museum, I felt like I had another family. And I just want to mention their names. There's Bob Forster, there's Bill Curran, Rand Hope, who's right here that does all the videoing. And there's McKevin, who made us look like we were airbrushed, thank God. <laughs> and Kevin Shaughnessy and Bill. I did, I, I don't think I forgot anybody. I'm okay? Okay. Okay, so let me tell you a little story about how I got infatuated with teachers. And um, it doesn't matter if I take long because Bill is going to come back, but there's some things that I really do, I really do want to accomplish. Okay, so um, what happened was I had an aunt, Philomena, and she worked for the school district. She was what they called in those days. It wasn't politically correct, but she was a cleaning lady. And she asked my mother, she said, Antoinette, can I take Vincent to school with me because it gets dark by four o'clock and I'm afraid to be in the building by myself. And of course, my mother said yes. My mother, actually, my mother went back to work and made money to send me to college. but. Here's what happened. I found myself in those big empty classrooms and those long endless corridors. There's almost a captivating melancholy about being in an empty school. Once filled with life, something magical happened as each class took on the teacher's personality, a windowsill with decorated with crepe paper a, for each holiday, a sweater hung over a chair near the desk, a scent of perfume, a storybook on the desk that might have been read that day, a poem hung on the wall or a map. And I became infatuated with the idea of school. I went to Connor's school when I was little and then they changed district lines and I had to go to Keeley School. And I was crying because I thought I would miss my friends. When I got to Keeley School, all the kids were watching American Bandstand and I'm not gonna talk about that story again. That became a big thing with me. So anyway, um, the next thing that I wanna tell you about is, um, well, I wanna tell you something about the teachers of Hoboken. They did teach us well, and I have some proof here. First of all, what happened to cursive handwriting? <laughs> you have no idea that I taught eighth grade with Sandra Sansevier. You have no idea the kids either print it or they used this big bubble handwriting that went to the left that looked like graffiti. And that's because it's not being taught. And we don't know why, and I guess kindergarten, first, second, third, they just don't have the time anymore. But you know something? If you see my writing, Stanley Palmasano's writing, we all slant to the right. You know, it's, it looks like a nun wrote it. Okay, so the next thing is assembly programs. There was assembly programs for holidays. There was assembly programs for patriotic things. Where are they? Why aren't those kids being brought down to the auditorium to an assembly program? Who knows? Now, speaking of Miss Marnell, outlining gave students structure and provided a quick overview if you were having a test. It was an outline to look at, and it had Roman numerals, Arabic numerals, and then smaller letters, and it went all the way down the line. And that's what Miss Marnell wanted. But it just wasn't her. A lot of the teachers were using outlining, except if she didn't like it, she used to put a big red mark on it, so what? <laughs> okay. 
The next thing was memorizing. <laughs> okay, the next thing was memorizing and reciting poetry. That gave kids pride in understanding forms of poetry, and it also got them up out of their seats to recite. But the funny thing is, if a kid didn't study the, the poem the night before, and the first line was, the quality of mercy is not strained, and the, all of you know the second line of that poem, but a kid, would, a kid would randomly write, how do I love thee, let me count the ways. So that didn't really go over that big. Um, the next thing was copying notes from the chalkboard. Now that's a big thing. That's not happening anymore. I understand that most kids go on a computer and before that they had mimeograph machine that was dipped in that alcohol that got us high. But let me tell you something about copying notes from the blackboard, and I did this all the way into college. I would look at those notes that the teacher gave us that we copied from the board. You had to copy it, that was part of the lesson. And I would use that at home to rewrite, and that was my method for studying. Because when you rewrote what you saw, it stayed in the brain, it was a wonderful thing. Drawing and sketching, especially in science class, enable students to grasp and remember difficult concepts. Well, I have to tell you something. Mary Ann Villanella, who's here tonight, was the science teacher, but I had the other science teacher in the building, Madeline Spadavecchia. And I wondered why, I wondered why we were drawing a grasshopper for a period of time, but in, Seriously, a Japanese study was done and said that that had so many merits for kids. And they're, 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 just, they're learning now that a kid really doesn't have to dissect or anything like that. Kids could sketch, and a lot of kids love to draw. I mean, I, I tutor a student now in Marine View Plaza who loves drawing all the time. So the sketching, um, well, how many of you know the three parts of a grasshopper? Can you remember? Head, thorax, abdomen. Well, I was waiting for somebody to say it. Okay, so that, this what I just read is the epilogue in the book, so you'll see it again, and you might want to talk about that sometime. Okay, I'm almost done. Well, I was going to ask Marie Radigan and Mr. Tortorella to stand up and listen to what I say, or do you want me to put that on hold? If you want, you do whatever you want. Mr. Tortorella's gonna come up later, speak. Okay, all right, so, is it, I'll, I'll talk to Marie Radigan now. Marie, Marie, will you stand up? Just wave to the crowd, Marie. Yeah. Okay. Wave to the crowd, Marie. That's okay, Marie. I don't want to, I don't want to make you stand up. Yay. One of Hoboken's best teachers. I had the opportunity to visit Marie's classroom once a week. She had the ability to maintain skill in both classroom management and, the same, and at the same time taught with a caring and nurturing teaching style. I grew up with Marie in the same neighborhood on Madison Street, she lived and I lived on Monroe Street and we, we used to play in the street, jump rope or whatever. Then a beauty parlor came. I don't know, maybe I was playing in the beauty parlor. I don't remember. <laughs> um, I grew up with Marie in the same neighborhood, okay? And we became friends. One thing changed. She um, began to work. I said before, my, my Aunt Philomena worked in the school. She became my Aunt Philomena's aide. Um, my Aunt Philomena became her aide. And the next part is connected to 
my aunt, and I'll get back to it later so I give Mr. Miller some time. Philomena's daughter graduated from Demarest in 1947, and she has such a great rapport with Bill. They're always chatting on the phone. She sent us her 1947 yearbook with black and white photography that is unbelievable. And Bill carefully chose the pages and pictures of my cousin to be in the book. So there's the colored pictures that McKevin took, and there's also the black and white, and everything is beautifully done. I wish my cousin was here, but she lives in Connecticut, and she's 92 years old. She went to um, number eight school, which was Leinkoff School, and then she went to Brandt School for junior high, which was seven, eight, nine, and then she went to Demarest, and she became the class of 1947. Okay, I'll come back. Thank you, Vincent. You know, part of the whole thing about teachers is the images that you're left with. For example, I remember Miss Guida. She was my third grade teacher in the old Wallace. Well, she used to come into the class like Loretta Young. She had these big dresses with flowers and everything else. She always looked impeccable. And I just never forgot those moments when she arrived. Well, one day I was on the path and there was a lady, just a pair of legs and tons of boxes from those Manhattan department stores people used to go to. And finally we got into Hoboken and the boxes went down and all of a sudden I recognized it. It was Miss Mary Smith. English teacher from Hoboken High. There she was, this glamorous little, by then 60-something-year-old woman, gold high heels like Hollywood, and off she went. And in a way, to me, it was like seeing a movie star away from the studio. There was Miss Smith, not at her desk, but coming from Manhattan on a school holiday with all the boxes of the dresses she used to wear at school. Stanley Parmesano, which who's here right now, told me that she used to read the New York Times in Mr. Coolidge's class. And she used to turn to the fashion pages from the ads from the New York stores and the designers. Well, Stanley Parmesano turned out to be one of the most beautiful, most fashionable women in all of Hoboken, all because of Hoboken. And one of Hoboken's most wonderful teachers as well. And she's sitting right there, a true goddess of Hoboken without question. Anyhow, the impressions are wonderful. But one time, we marched the kids down to Lackawanna Station for some kind of opening or dedication. And I, all of a sudden, we all sat down and somebody took the podium, beautifully dressed, spoken magnificently. He knocked everybody out of the ballpark, the mayor, the governor, whoever was there, the superintendents of the railroad. And I sat beaming. He was our principal, Mr. Tortorella, and he was just perfect. And he, I was so proud in Hoboken that he was one of us. He represented us, and I'm going to introduce now Mr. Charles Tortorella, who was one of the great sons of Hoboken. I will be brief and I will be old school because if I wasn't old school, I'd be reading off my cell phone. Um, I would like to address a crisis that we have in this country. Not the crisis at the border, not the crisis at the gas station and the economy, not the crisis with women's health. I want to address the crisis that we have in this country with the dire shortage of teachers. It is so bad that in Newark, New Jersey, the state is allowing them to bring back retired teachers who are still collecting their pension, and they are being paid $92,000. But this is a national shortage, and the real problem is, if we don't address this shortage, then the, the crises that we have now and all the future ones no one's going to be prepared to address them, not politically, not economically, not scientifically. And I don't understand why there's a shortage. I really don't. 
Teachers make tremendous amount of money. Uh, the working conditions are like being in a country club. Uh, the bonuses that they get at Christmas and the year-end bonuses, shh. And then how about staff development in Hawaii and Aruba and in uh, the Virgin Islands? So why teachers don't want to stay or even go into it, I really don't understand. Actually, none of those things exist. Teachers are overwhelmed. They are underpaid, unappreciated. And most of the teachers in this room know that you have done so much with so little for so long, you wouldn't even know what to expect and what to demand. And so I want to compliment both Vinny and Bill, who two years ago, when they came up with this idea, were really visionary. Because I think that since teachers feel unappreciated, this is a way for not only the teachers who are in the book, because I, when they approached me, I said, well, there are going to be a lot of teachers who will be left out. But this is a tribute to all of the teachers. And it's like having a wedding. And you'd like to invite 400 people, but you could only invite 150. You still have the wedding. So, you know, I think this is a tribute to everyone. But I also think that we have two people who reflect so positively on education. Bill, world's leading expert on cruise ships, who used to bring his travel experiences into his sixth grade social study classes. It doesn't get any better than that. And Vinnie Cassessa, who in the 90s and in the 2000s was considered to be the leading pragmatic expert on eighth grade students maximizing their potential on standardized testing. And so, Bill and Vinny, thank you, because I think this really play, plays tribute to a lot of people who truly deserve it. Thank you for a second so I could read my tribute to you. Mr. Tortorella. In his role as principal, Mr. Tortorella knew that empowering teachers impacted education to change in a positive and powerful direction. He encouraged me and trusted my judgment to support, let me get these glasses. Oh, that's better. To support instructional leadership through mentoring and coaching, he let me go to all of the eighth grade classes and prep them for the test. I sat on the committee in Trenton that developed the test. So the kids were doing okay. And then he started having me coach the colleagues. We would go down to the Demarest uh, library and I would turn key all the new methods to the teachers. And as Marie could tell you and Sandra, they loved it because it was new things that they hadn't done before. In, in Wallace School, he had me going down as far as third grade with the new methods, picture prompt and things like that. The essay was kind of tough. It was a persuasive essay for, for grade six, seven, and eight and they had to really know how to do that. They could have had that outline from Ms. Marnell. One time, Mr. Tortorella was conducting a workshop on the statewide coma model, and he asked me to go with him, and I said, but you're going. They're gonna expect you to speak. He said, no, I want to give you, this is how unselfish and how much he cared for what teachers were learning he said, I want you to go and turnkey the methods to the group. We stayed at a pretty nice hotel and we met downstairs in the conference room. And I want to thank you, Mr. Tortorella, for your encouraging me and my self-confidence 
and your overall trust in my handling of students. Thank you. Okay, then we're going to switch again back. later. Thank you, Mr. Tortorella. <laughs> you know, there's, there's, I, I can only go randomly, and I do apologize if I'm overlooking anything, but there are so many details about teaching. Miss Evans is here. She's now Miss Pittman. She was a wonderful liaison to some of the kids who had not a hundred, but a thousand problems. And she was able to reach those kids in a one-to-one -one basis. And she's sitting here. Take a bow, Miss Evans. Miss Pittman, Mrs. Pittman now. And she, we used to have talent shows. And Miss Evans, as she was in those days, put on a pair of the biggest red spike high heels you've ever seen and a tight, tight dress. And she got out at that student talent show and she was Tina Turner. Loves, what's love got to do with it? And we know what's got to do with it, don't we, Miss Evans? Absolutely. And then there's Dr. Mary Nadio who's sitting there who put on wonderful productions and concerts and so forth in our school system that made us proud. Stand up, Mary, and have a nice wave. And she made, like Miss Evans and others, made the kids feel special. To get on a stage is tough for people, but they did it. They made them shine. And then my dear friend, Peter Ising, who wrote songs and is the Stephen Sondheim of Hoboken. Could you come up and say a few words for us, please? And so forth. One of Pe Peter has made a lot of students find their way in the arts. Please say a few words, Peter, about your days in Hoboken. Vinny, Bill, you're to be congratulated. You had an idea. You honed that idea. You went over and over it, reached out to many, many people. And now your dream has come to fruition. Congratulations to both of you. Take a bow. But I had 35 great years in Hoboken. Some students still keep in touch with me today. Some of them even call me their father. And uh, I've had so many talented students and, uh, and also had many uh, students who had lots of problems. Uh, I'll never forget this one boy, uh, he passed away now, but uh, I used to counsel him because he had a severe drug, drug problem. And uh, he came back to see me a couple of years later. He said, Mr. Isaac, you saved my life. And I'm not, that's not to brag about myself, but there's so many of you out there that can tell the same stories. Um, my wife was a great, great teacher for 35 years too, but it, it's an honor to be here. Um, I don't know why you asked me to speak, but, but uh, I can't wait, I tell you, I can't wait to get home later, maybe pour a glass of sarsaparilla Cispar, and read, read about all you, many, Many of you people who are here today, my colleagues, it's wonderful seeing you all here. And God bless you, Bill. Thank you. And speaking of the arts, back in the 80s, I had a little boy in my class who couldn't grow. And his legs were bending in. And he needed a $25,000 operation to a middle class family in Hoboken. It was a lot of money. So I decided to invest 15 cents and I would write to Frank Sinatra in Palm Springs. Well, 15 cents, how much can you lose? I told him the story, you know it's his hometown. He wasn't always on the best of terms with Hoboken, but it was worth a try. Two weeks later, I got a check for $25,000. No note, no letter, he paid for the whole thing. I wrote back to Mr. Sinatra twice, never heard again, but it was an impromptu gift of goodness and kindness to the children of Hoboken, which was very, very nice. So I'm very proud to acknowledge the teachers of Hoboken. They're an outstanding group, some really wonderful people, interesting personalities, stories to tell, all sorts of things. Even my the guy who washes my windows at home, he's 62, he was my student. God, 62 and he was my student. I shiver when I think of those numbers. And he said that Miss Melosha, the Hoboken High School Italian teacher, 
took extra time when he came from Italy to learn English. Today, he has done very well for himself, owns his own company, all from somebody taking the time to pay a little after school attention to somebody at school. Is there anybody out there that I didn't acknowledge that I can't really see, not acknowledge, but is... We mentioned that in the beginning. Yes, I hate to. <laughs> yes, 115 books, all from starting with Hoboken. And did we acknowledge Miss Villanella? There she is. She looks like my youngest sister. She was my homeroom teacher in 1962. Unbelievable, wonderful, and so forth. I remember Miss Villanella. She was the new girl on the block, and she was so beautiful. She had her high heels on, black suede high heels, and her big bouffant hair and everything else and so forth. She, look at her now. There she is. And by the way, she still lives in Hoboken, which in itself is unique because so many people moved away from Hoboken. I, before I forget, I just wanted to say something else. My father was a policeman. Charlie's father was a policeman. There's others here who may remember that era. And yesterday, Dick Carroll died. He was 98, Mary Pat Carroll's father. And he was a policeman with my dad in that era of the 40, late 40s, 50s, 60s. That's all passing away. And so all that connection in history, little by little, like a carpet rolling up, it's all disappearing. Well, time does move on. Vincent, return to Vincent for more. What I just, I, I think my cousin in Connecticut is watching this. So I want her to see her picture from Demarest in 1947. And Catherine, if you're watching, this is you today with me in Florida. Oh, nice. Nice. And now I'm not letting Miss Villanella out of the room. Until... You have to talk by the mic. Okay, okay, I will. I'm not going to let Miss Villanella out of the room until I do my take on her. But I think Bill really covered it. But it was kind. Of, it was. It actually. It was the first thing I wrote when we did this book. Okay. I enrolled in Demarest High School in September of 1959. During my school years, many of my female teachers wore navy blue suits or dresses, had their hair blue tinted or pulled back in a bun, and wore sensible and sometimes orthopedic shoes. <laughs> but as if a silent trumpet, trumpet sounded in my ears, Miss Mary Ann Villanella walked into my homeroom where my homeroom teacher would act as her guide or mentor. I will not talk about my homeroom teacher, but she wasn't Marianne. Miss V, as she was soon dubbed, wore stylish skirts or dresses, off black stockings and four inch high heels. In a recent phone chat, she explained that she had her hair done and I insisted that it was because she saw Butterfield 8 with Elizabeth Taylor. And alas, alas, we had a stylish teacher, a stylish young teacher with whom we could relate. Like a beam of sunshine, she smiled and treated us with understanding and respect. As adolescents, who, as ad, and as adolescents, they sometimes need somebody that would listen and not judge. <laughs> So Marianne, thank you. I'm glad you're here. And now I want to acknowledge my student from 1970. If you would stand up, Donna Pieri. Yeah. And that was a long time ago. And um, there's a young man here called John Smith. Are you still in the room? Oh, OK, John Smith was my student. And Kathleen Kelly was my student, too. <laughs> Yeah, she had the bandana on and the hippie hair. Okay, so um, we're moving right along. Take your time. I, I'm okay, Bill. Okay, so here goes. Um, so I just want to end what I'm going to say. And there's so much that is unsaid because 
what we did, we didn't write this book to tell you how they were teaching trigonometry or, or um, figuring out chemical symbols or balancing equations or whatever. We spoke about their human side. And you know, those of you that are teachers, those of you that are parents, what that means to a kid. And I want to leave you, how many remember the film To So With Love? Well, there was a young lady that sang a song and it became a popular recording. And I'm just going to borrow a few lines. A friend who taught me right from wrong and weak from strong, that's a lot to learn. What can I give you in return? Thank you. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you, Vincent. Indeed, it was a world of desks and pencils and chalk and going home at three and summer vacation and getting report cards and parents' night and all that part of that world of 10,000 school days ago. And it was wonderful. And we were part of it. And I'm proud of that. You're proud of it. Vincent's proud of it. And we pay homage to all those teachers up there in the classroom in the sky who are looking down today on us. Miss Smith, Miss Marnell, Mr. Coleman, Mr. Gaynor. They're all here. I'm getting more sentimental as I get older because, you know, it's, time does pass. And so many people now, like light bulbs in the chandelier, and the bulbs go out. And there's only a few bulbs left, but... This book hopefully reminds us of those wonderful people. Bob, our next step is to ask the studio audience if they have anything they want to add to our presentation. Stand up if we you have We know anything. there's other comments in the room and we're just gonna pass the microphone around. Stanley, you wanna say something? First of all, um, I remember Bill and Vinny starting this project. And I knew there were so many teachers that we had as kids and how many teachers we taught with. And I couldn't imagine how you guys could have put this together. I'm blown away. I have to say that your experience growing up in school and your experience as teachers and speakers made this a, a wonderful day. I want to thank you so much. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. Anyone here? Eric? Say what you wrote. Hi, Eric Kammer, class of 1976. So I went to uh, Demarest and Hoboken High School and Wallace. What was your last name? Uh, Kammer, K-A-M-M-E-R. My... Uh, Brother Michael, as well as Ellen, also went to uh, Hoboken. Michael still lives in Hoboken. And uh, one question I wanted to ask both of you is, how did the social media change the electronic aspect versus what we used to do um, many years ago? Well, I, Vincent can address it in a moment. When I was getting ready to retire, which was 2002, they were starting automatic attendance. It was no longer the record keeping we used to have with a fountain pen. And we used to have to blot the mistakes out and so forth and hand the register in. So things were changing. It's, I couldn't even know what it's like today. But I, a funny little regulation set in. You couldn't have pink and blue attendance cards anymore because that was no longer correct. You had to have same color for boys as girls. And little things like that were starting and changing. So what it's like today, I imagine, is quite different. I retired in 2010. I don't know either. It's a, it's a, I don't know either, but I could tell you something that's scary especially on all the publicity with politics, kids are failing math and reading. What are we going to do? I can't go back. Bill can't go back. Stanley can't go back. What are we going to do? Was it the pandemic and the virtual, the virtual learning? You know, because my, my friends back there, or Lana, if she's here, would tell me that her son had the phone on his lap. So I, I don't know what happened, but we've got to, somebody has to fix this, and we can't do it again. No. Nope. Bill, can you turn the thing back? Yes. Yes. 
if you wanted the stars, I'd ride across the sky in heaven. Ah, oh. this Miss Liz Falco, one of our principals and administrators in Hoboken. Yes. Well, um, would you tell them about the first day of Holocaust and how that happened in 1947, and then um, she. We're wasting time. All right, well, let's get right. All right. Anyhow, ladies and gentlemen, I we, thank we you for still, coming. We still have more. Oh, we still have some yeah, more. Definitely. Okay. Um, I did want to give a special shout out. You did acknowledge museum staff, but McKevin Shaughnessy. He designed stand, the book. Stand up, McKevin. He made this book look so good. Uh, all the different. Uh, you know, mediums, all the different colors, the And he textures. made me look 20 minutes younger, and I appreciate yeah. that. Thank you so uh, much. It looks better than a year above. Yes, wonderful. It really does. You said that before. I said an airbrush. Yeah. Okay. okay. Fabulous. Um, and then when you guys were talking about teachers who are no longer with us, I just had this kind of moment. And uh, the teacher who I connected with, not in the classroom, was Lee Rains. Oh. <laughs> Lee Rains was about four foot nine and had more energy than a 10 foot person. And when the museum started to come into its own and started fundraising for this space, uh, we sent out letters. And the first letter that came back with a check for a thousand dollars was not from Frank Sinatra it was from Lee Rains so I think of her and her dedication to all the different things teaching Holocaust studies in 1982 was not really in vogue and then when she came home she would put her energies into the Girl Scout house okay and just a lovely person Lee and her husband Richard. So just wanted to state that. Um, so can I give the microphone to someone else? This gentleman here? No? Okay. Anyone else? Anyone else? For a hundred dollars. Anybody got anything to say? I'll in, make it 150. In, in the back. Anyone? Anyone? Okay, we got one. I just want to compliment. Bill and Vinny, uh, on bringing to light the life of teachers, and we in the profession, I'm a teacher myself, I'm a, an out-of-bounds neighbor from West New York, I taught 36 years, and when I share teaching stories, I always bring to the minority of people who I'm with, what kids really look at when they come to school. And when I retired, I told a group of people who attended that what a kid feels towards a school is heart warming sometimes and heartbreaking. And we hear every story. And when I said to compare one short story, when we went to school, I know myself, we looked for summer vacations and we couldn't wait to get out those doors. And one difference I saw when I became a teacher is when we had summer vacations, those kids after one week couldn't wait to get into the door. We were their parents, we were their uncles, aunts, grandparents. We were their life as brilliantly brought out by Vinnie and Bill. Now I know Bill over 50 years and it's an honor to know him. And I met Vincent through the generosity of Bill and fellow educators here from Hoboken who welcomed my wife and I to lunches and share stories and war stories and the graciousness and to share the successes. Now on a lighter note, when I met Bill Miller, we were studying to become a teacher at Jersey City State. And at the time, Bill did not have a car. And I would come every morning we came on 14th Street and pick up this uh, gentleman with this different type of outfit every so often and a briefcase always in hand. And we would drive him to school. 
thank God he trusted my driving skills or else we would be just sitting here with a very, very historic, pleasant, great person, Bill Miller. And Vinny, it's been an honor to have met you too. Congratulations on a great accomplishment. Thank you, thank you, Vincent. Going to Irene in the back. Hello. Um, I'm not a teacher, but I recognize a lot of teachers here. And I came specifically to honor Mr. He was my teacher. I won't say what year. <laughs> but I think I can, um, I just wanted to say on behalf of all of your students, I just wanted to say thank you. We're really very grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Here's one, Sandy. He'll, I'll get him. Sandy? Oh. Yes. Should we tell me tell you hello? Oh, um, I just wanted to commend you on the job. It's a great, great effort and a wonderful book. But I also wanted to say that as a teacher, if you think about it, there is a book in every one of us. Yes, oh yes, very true. And so, those of you that don't have anything to do in retirement, you might think about that. You have a book, Marie. You have a book, Liz. Yeah. <laughs> you still have books. Oh, let me just do her and then you're next. Uh, backing up what Liz said, I'm Kathy Massis, most of you know. Um, November, November 1st, it's National Novel Writing Month. So if you go to Google, put in National Novel Writing Month, there's a website that's very active and there's a lot of support and help. So uh, I've, I've been, I have about four drafts done of novels and um, I'm gonna start again tomorrow with another, another thing. So every, look into it because it's fun. It's fun, it's a good way to spend your time retired. And consider writing it longhand, cursive. Bill, thank you very much. Um, Vinny, thank you very much. I would like to pay homage to those teachers in the 40s who made their way down to Trenton and are responsible for the tenure laws oh. that we have oh. in Hoboken today. Oh, in yes. In New Jersey. Yes, yes, yes. Cool. I'm going. Oh. The student. Um, so I had Vinny for ninth grade. In, Hold it closer to your mouth. And Joseph F. Brand. And because of him, to this day, I love science. He was young and he taught so modern. I came from St. Anne's, so it was parochial school. So coming to him, he just widened my horizon and to this day on teachers appreciation day i always send him a note thanking him because, oh, of, because of him i love science nice. to this day Wonderful. thank you and i'd like to just to say to stanley pomizano from my son because she is the teacher that stood out to my son oh. so thank you stanley oh wonderful <laughs> okay are we done Let's do one more applause. This is a great afternoon. I feel great. Hope you do too. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, everybody. Thank for you, coming. Vincent. Thank you. Very Thank you, Ms. Cool. Colonella. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Cool.